things and lasts for quite a while. And usually that's because it is tied to what is going on offline. As in this case, there was a real group, the alt-right, alt that exists outside of social media and one that exists in social media. And that movement back and forth of information between the online world and the offline world is part of the core reason why we're interested in the area of social cybersecurity. And it's one of the things that makes this area a very daunting and very hard area of study. Now, what was that satire? Well, this what you're seeing here, the first post, is the actual is one of the illustrative um, posts that was sent out that said, you know, I or my brother or my cousin or my bro older brother went, we went to this movie and got beaten up. And they show people, okay, like this. None of those occurred. In some cases, we know that they were simply catch up on them. Most of these were photoshopped. In contrast, the satire said a similar kind of text. So if all you were doing is analyzing text. You would never know that, the, that these were satire. But instead, they used pictures of things like SpongeBob SquarePants with a black eye or another picture here of Two-Face. And they are saying, again, the same message. I went and I got beaten up. Now, here's another interesting tidbit. The one about tidbit was not realized to be satire or joke by many, many people who responded to that tweet. In fact, some people thought, oh, this is terrible, a poor person. And it took the New York Times or the Washington Post, I forget which, to actually come in and say, by the way, that picture, that's from Two-Face from the Batman movies. And it wasn't until then that people realized that that too was satire. Now, of course, you know, disinformation such as these, such saying things that aren't true, has always been with us, right? And, you know, in 1897, you know, uh, the New York Times actually gave a report through normal media at that time, the newspapers, uh, that Mark Twain was dying in poverty in London. Of course, Mark Twain responded, you know, that this was not the case. As he noted, the report of his death was an exaggeration. Calling out disinformation can definitely stop it. You can do it with humor or you do, or you can just do it straight out. But it's not quite that simple because timing matters. And with social media and social cybersecurity, stopping disinformation by calling it out is all about timing. The other thing that's important to recognize is that disinformation nowadays with the advent of of social media has a slightly different flavor. For example, during the pandemic, the amount of disinformation that has occurred has been enormous compared to ever before. Typically after like during an election time period or during a natural disaster, prior to the pandemic, there would be four, 10, 30 different pieces of disinformation. There were thousands during this dis during the pandemic, which is why many people labeled it a disinfodemic. Huge numbers of storylines. And unlike previous, and they moved glo they moved globally. They were repeated. They moved across platforms. Many of them were very, very political based disinformation. And they moved from one country to another as part of the national strategies of various countries to actually show that they were coping well with the pandemic. Within the US and within many countries, especially in Western Europe and so on, these messages took on an increasingly partisan divide and the disinformation around the pandemic was actually used to further pol polarize the conservatives from the liberals in a wide variety of states. Another feature of this of social cybersecurity is that a lot of times um, groups that are going to engage in nefarious activity plan out their actions and give early signals of that in social media. But you can also use social media to determine whether something like the Benghazi consulate attack is a natural upsurge of behavior on the part of the people in the area, 
um, or whether in fact this was kind of a covert terror, terror attack. In the case of the Benghazi one, one of the ways that was done was we were actually, in fact, I was actually over in Europe at the time training people on how to detect uh, terror groups and social media. And we're watching what's going on around the consulate. And all, all of a sudden, things go crazy online, right? All of a sudden, there starts being a lot of stuff about Benghazi being hit, the consulate being hit, and so on. This is the red dots here is what the social media response a retweet network looked, um, you know, within a few hours. And you'll see there's lots of big stars. That's very typical of what you will get in, in Twitter when you see, when you get events like this. But what that what is going on there? Well, all these big center nodes, those are news agencies. News agencies make up less than 1% of the actors in social media, but they are the most frequently, among the top 10% most frequently retweeted. The second thing is they were suggesting that perhaps this was due to this movie that came out called The Innocence of the Muslims. In point of fact, prior to the consulate attack, which occurred here, there was no mention of that movie in social media. All the mention came after the attack and all the mentions were people retweeting and talking about the speculation due to uh, the news agency. Moreover, there was no signal that there was going to be an attack whatsoever in Twitter. In contrast, in Egypt at the time, there were protests quite a bit. Okay, many of them were at the embassy there. There was lots of signal. Now, they didn't go in and destroy the embassy. They didn't try to kill people. You know, they weren't burning things up. But, you know, it was Egypt. And at that point in time, you know, every couple of weeks, like clockwork, there would be another protest. It was always planned, discussed. People were told where to meet and where to go in Twitter. And you could see the cyclical pattern of that. Social cybersecurity is about trying to help us identify these kinds of patterns. I will say that please at any point, if you have a question, just, you know, ask it or type it into chat and, you know, please feel free to interrupt me with questions. That's absolutely fine. Now, if we go a little bit further and say, well, what else are terror? How else are terrorists using the social media these days? Let me give you an example from ISIS. So what you're seeing here is a picture of what were thought to be members of ISIS. OK, uh, that were collected via a kind of a special social media inspired snowballing approach. And we often think of this as a Syrian focused extremist group. It was not just members of ISIS that also included a lot of people that ISIS was trying to recruit and they were trying to recruit them through different storylines. In particular, they were trying to recruit women and they had like several different stories that you see out there. One of the stories that they were using and propagating in social media was, you know, to join ISIS because, you know, you're a good God fearing Muslim woman and this will help you have, you know, find a man and have kids. The second story that they told was to other young women, which was basically come and join ISIS because you can be a chick with a gun and we'll give you guns. Two totally different stories, both were promoted in these communities by bots. Now, in this particular community, you'll see this little green dot of everything up here, okay, the little circle. That is actually known, and that is actually the Fear Be Known bot. Now, I'm going to tell you what the Fear Be Known bot and did and how it played a role in helping ISIS out. But first, I want to tell you a little bit about Twitter. What Twitter is doing, so what we have here is all these people that are basically talking about ISIS and these big groups. If you go and um, cluster this, you'll see that, you know, light, any of the Levain or Line and network clustering things will show you that there's one, two, three big groups. If you go and look at what their language they're speaking, look at their characters, okay? This group is all in Arabic down here, the green ones. This group here, is the bigger blue one, is in blue and green. It's, a, it's in part Arabic and part English. And that's usually because they're writing the stories in English. And then they will add a word in, in Arabic, such as inshallah. 
And then up here, this group is all in English. So now, at this point in time, Anonymous gave in a big list of people to Twitter and said, please suspend these. These are members of ISIS. Notice that, oh, we've colored here in blue all the ones that are suspended. What this really tells you is that ISIS, I mean, I mean, sorry, what this really tells you is that Anonymous and Twitter at that point in time could not speak, could not read and process Arabic. Because these people down here were talking about the exact same issues and looked exactly the same as these ones up here and these ones here in terms of their vitrolicness, their closeness to ISIS, et cetera. This thing, as I said, is the Farabi Gnome bot. The Farabi Gnome bot is known as a kind of social influence bot uh, where, or a botnet where, uh, where each of the little bots within it, which are completely automated accounts, are busy sitting there initially, simply sending messages with long lists of app mentions where all they're doing is mentioning the other bots. That form, that makes them look like this kind of a community. Now, Twitter searches for communities and groups, okay? And so this group is going to get their attention and they're going to pay attention to it and they're going to try to give all the members of that group back, you know, interesting stuff. And if other people mention one of the members of this group or retweet something from one of the members of this group, you know, the entire group is going to get recommended to that person. So what this bot does is it starts every now and then retweeting this uh, imam from in here and the imam doesn't have to know about what they're doing okay but the, and they probably don't but what they start doing is that imam turns out to be one who was um touted by al-qaeda as really understanding and promoting the correct jihad so this bot is then retweeting that particular imam these people who are already sort of following that imam, because that imam was important, that group, now had this bot being recommended to them to follow. All of them now start following this bot. This bot now sends out messages about that referencing this particular site. That particular site is, um, ha is uh, saying that they're collecting money uh, for the children of Syria, and is thought to be a widely thought to be a money laundering site for ISIS. So in this way, bots can be used, right, to both promote certain actors like the imam, to promote certain sites and sell you things, okay, and thereby influence people's behavior. That particular data, if you further analyze it, what you see is that based on their relationships within uh, within Twitter, you can actually separate out the new fighters the, or the potential recruits from the passive observers, from the popular fighters, from uh, the various religious authorities and journalists, because they have very, very different patterns of behavior in terms of who is connecting to whom and who is saying what. Uh, Dr. Carly, Terrorists are good. Go ahead. Uh, we're being asked by Dylan, did the imam reciprocate interactions or were they recommended just off of the one way communication? The imam did not reciprocate communications. The imam's messages were just simply retweeted by that group. Thank you. Okay. Um, and like I said, the imam may not have had any clue that this was going on. <laughs> Okay, now in terms of um, social media, so far now we've seen that there's these bots out there, there's these people out there, there's terrorists using social media, but there's still another thing I wanna point out about, about the web, and that is that conspiracy theories are, are rampant within it, and that a lot of people will actually read and listen to these conspiracy theories in socials in on the in social media and that though and that the individuals who are prone to reading these and getting involved in these conspiracy theories have a tendency to be uh, to get engaged and act in violent ways as happened with Pizzagate simply moving the individual data off of say Twitter or off of Facebook all that does is it moves the information and the people to more obscure platforms, often on the dark web, 
where they where it still is going on and then it comes back out in ways that that are harmful of course bots in social media also have the ability to spread negative information often they do that by retweeting hate speech uh, messages that contain a hate speech and what we've noticed is that as the amount of negativity toward a top toward a country increases the number of cyber attacks against that country increases now that does not mean now what that is suggesting is that the negativity might be causing random people to engage in cyber attacks against those countries because they're getting increasingly upset and angry okay it also may be that other countries are seeing this as an opportunity to actually first create dismay in the country like let's say it's russia against the us russia is trying to create dismay in the us oh everybody hates you and then bam oh yes we're going to attack you okay but there is a linkage. So the point is social media in and of itself is not isolated from all the other ways in which cyber data is, is affected. The other point is that disinformation on social media doesn't just affect things like cyber attacks, it also uh, leads to the breeding of intolerance. What we saw happening during the pandemic, and I wanna look at these circles up here, is that there were, Individuals out there who, when the pandemic first is hitting and people are starting to pay attention to it in February, are sending out hate messages. These are the red dots. The yellow dots are those that contain abusive speech, and the blues are just random things. A lot of the hate originally was directed at you know, the cruise ships, and some of it was directed at China. But what's happening is that there's bots underlying this, and they're being used to introduce uh, those spreading hate speech to each other. Notice that the abusive groups are already connected here. Uh, and, and so by, you know, just within a little bit of time, you've got these hate communities forming in the middle, and then they spread out and they start spreading their hate and they get more people started spreading hate speech as people got more and more and more upset in the early days of the pandemic. So disinformation was actually used to foster these groups and to foster their behavior by talking about such thing, by suggesting, for example, that um, you could get you could get COVID by eating in Chinese restaurants, by you could get COVID by having China, by getting, um, ordering Chinese food to your house and so on. And so there were a number of disinformation stories that was used to foster this. But once the hate groups formed, they were targeted and they were, it was suggested to them, other groups to hate other than who they started. And in fact, it was suggested to them that the people they really should be hating was not the, the cruise ships, was not even necessarily Chinese, but it was scientists because the scientists were lying to you that there really was a pandemic. And so you have this growing upsurge of anti-science behavior that has been fostered by disinformation during the pandemic by spreading it more and more of it into these hate groups that, that, that were first formed. So what is social cybersecurity? Well, social cybersecurity is the science that's designed to characterize, understand, and forecast cyber-mediated changes in human behavior and, and uh, social, cultural, political outcomes, and it's the engineering to build the technology we need to do this, right? So where cybersecurity is about hacking machines and data, social cybersecurity is about hacking people. And that is the point why it's very different and requires very different skills than does um, cybersecurity. There are many influence operations in on, on, that occur online, and in influence operations, which are a big part of what social cybersecurity is about. The idea is to control and manipulate individuals and communities, not just by affecting the actors, not just by affecting the narrative, but by controlling both of those. And the most influential of social cybersecurity attacks to date have been those that have changed who you, people are talking to online at the same time that they change what they were talking about. 
There are, of course, a large number of tools that are used to do this, such as memes, uh, which are these pictures with words on them, uh, bots that we already talked about, cyborgs, which are accounts, which are sometimes played by humans and sometimes by bots. Those are becoming increasingly common. Trolls, which are humans that are hiding under a fake persona and aimed at disrupting groups, often through the use of hate speech. Deep fakes, which uh, include the talking heads we've all seen by now. Uh, various uh, altered videos, such as the, many of those that were placed on YouTube during the pandemic, and subconscious cues. Cues are things that are tells that occur in text or in images that give you insight into the emotional state of the sender or and or impact the emotional response of the of the person who is reading it. So, for example, if I use um, write in all caps, right? It makes you think that I'm mad. That's my emotional tell, but it makes you feel, oh no, dismay, sadness, etc. If I have include a picture of a smiling little kitty with a pink background, that usually gets people excited and happy. And in fact, such things as cute kitten pictures have been used frequently says to get people to download malware to their machines. Some of the overarching goals of social cybersecurity is to enhance, uh, is, is basically to preserve and support and inform democratic society. The challenge, of course, is that disinformation, hate speech, information warfare, propaganda, et cetera, are amplified by, the, by cyber technology. There's more, there's more of it, it moves faster, it doesn't go away as fast. And so the idea is we want to remain vigilant to this, but how do we? How do we, especially when all the traditional ways of thinking about critical thinking don't work in social media? So the approach that has been suggested is to take a comprehensive end-to-end -end approach. To character, you have to characterize attempted manipulation. You have to understand the motivations behind the attacks. You have to forecast, identify, uh, various new challenges. You have to prevent and counter that stuff, pre prevent or counter information. You have to be able to divert attacks and you have to inoculate people so that communities and individuals can be more resilient. And you have to do this within a context where you realize that where as scientists, that all the stuff we do in social cybersecurity has to be highly socially relevant because this is affecting people's everyday lives, and it has to be multi-level, affecting both narratives and social relations, and it has to be help ensure resilience. And, and like disasters, you have to realize that you're not going to be able to totally prevent all bad things from happening in social media. So that's why we have a focus also on resilience. Social cybersecurity has been recognized now as an emerging scientific area. It lies between computer science or computational social science, policy, media, and marketing. It has elements of all three. It is also at least multidisciplinary, if not transdisciplinary, multimethodological, and it's very applied. So it has a very different flavor than what many universities have been used to in traditional disciplines. But the growth of research in this area is 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 amazing. It's just been growing up exponentially. And that and you know, ever since the start of Facebook and Twitter, people have started to work in this, worked more and more in this area, and it's just exploded. And it's really skyrocketed in the last three years. About three years ago, I asked people, how many people work in this area? And most people responded to me at that point in time, just me and the people in my lab. That is no longer how people respond. Today, if we look at people in the area of social cybersecurity, and this is based on a massive um, bibliometric study, the areas where you see most of the work coming out is that it's largely interdisciplinary. So each of the sizes of these nodes represents the amount, number of papers of that type, circa 20, early 2020. Communication has a lot, social science has a lot, web science, which is a new emerging areas, it has a lot, social computing, and so on. But you can see that from things like arts, 
to criminology, to psychology, to public health, there are people working in the area of social cybersecurity in just about in any discipline you can imagine. Dr. Basically, Dr. every discipline has something to contribute. Yes. Uh, we have another question coming in from Dina. Uh, how do you understand motivations if uh, a lot of the information about the perpetrators are missing? How do we understand the motivation of the perpetrators? Yes. That's one uh, of the reasons uh, we've, we've invented uh, this new technology called the Bend Approach, for which tries to look at intent. The other way to understand motivation is to construct what are called playbooks for their general way of doing things. Also, if the perpetrators are state, sp are state sponsored or coming out of countries, you know from their diplomatic processes in the past and other things what their general motivations are. But it is still a hard problem. Okay, going on with the with the nature of the area of social cybersecurity, as I said, these are the scientific fields. Every field out there has something to contribute and needs to contribute. In terms of the area of research, to date, the vast majority of work in this area has been focused on disinformation and misinformation. The second biggest area has been people talking about user behavior. It, that is, how do people respond to social media? Does it depress them or excite them? Is it better for autistic children or non-autistic children to use? And so on. Politics and democracy is another area where you're seeing a huge amount of work. Uh, you're also seeing stuff that is simply about identification of things like bots and trolls. But there's a growing amount of work that is looking at extremists and terrorists online that is looking at looking at this more from a crime perspective that is looking at this more from a disaster or a censorship perspective. But all of these are areas where you will see research. My point is that this area is very, very broad and there's people focusing on a large number of different issues. And they're using lots of different methods. A lot of the work has a quantitative field for it and therefore uses things like network analysis, dynamic network analysis, high dimensional network analysis, visual analytics, text analytics, etc. But there is a growing body of work in this area that is much more qualitative that utilizes in very detailed, deep understanding of the nuances within text and images and so on. So there's a growing you know, use of different kinds of methods. And what people are finding in social cybersecurity is that you usually want to use multiple methods. You get a bet, you get a better understanding of what is going on by taking a multi-methodological approach. Just as you understand better and able to predict better what is going on if you take an at least multidisciplinary approach. The scientific community circa 2018 basically looked like this. What you see here is, is this is, uh, this is co-authorship, and most of these are little labs where you know the um, where the uh, person who ran the lab and their graduate students are busy writing a bunch of or busy writing papers. But there was some movement between labs, and this is the original group who had produced the most papers in the area, and the connections among them. As it has grown, just in the past two years. OK, this is the network now. There are way more people involved and there's much more connection among a lot of different groups. In particular, there are 10 main centers that have that are funded by the Knight Foundation and all of those centers have now been are now connected and the growth in this area has gone from, you know, a couple thousand people to over 10,000 people and counting worldwide. So there's a huge uh, upsurge in the scientific community. Yes. Uh, following up uh, with this uh, surge in the scientific community, um, one of the participants wants to know what are some of the best journals to follow for these interdisciplinary topics? Um, well, please use journals and conference proceedings. Um, so some of the best journals, you will find a lot of work on this area published in computational mathematical organization theory. You'll find a bunch of it in the ASONOM journal. 
you'll find a bunch of it in the um, uh, what is it called the World Wide Web Journal. Um, you will also see it in the SBP BRIMS conference proceedings, uh, IC2S2 conference proceedings, and so on. If you email me, I'll send you a listing as of 2020 of where of the what were the top journals. Thank you. Social cybersecurity, as I mentioned, is this emerging uh, emerging computational social science area, and it's very applied. The reason why we often talk about it these days as transdisciplinary is because we found that traditional theories coming out of psychology, sociology, et cetera, traditional um, approaches coming out of computer science, although they translate sorta, they have to be translated because the volume of stuff is bigger because most of the traditional social science theories did not take the affordances of social media into account because a lot of the computer science stuff did not take people into account enough and that you really need to do these things kind of together because it's a different kind of um, logic in some sense that is being used when you've got huge volumes of data with, with interventions by media all the time and so on and with people acting from various uh, logic and dislogical ways. So um, what's easy in this area? relatively easy is using artificial intelligence to detect artificial intelligence. That is using machine learning techniques to detect bots, using machine learning techniques to detect fake, uh, deep fakes. What's hard is the fact that you've got people in there and people are constantly changing how they're using these things and how they're responding to these things. The other thing I will point out is that people thought that this thing would be done if we could just get great fact checkers. Inaccurate facts are not the issue. Inaccurate facts make up a very small percentage of the influence campaigns that are going on and the disinformation that is being spread. There's also a number of interesting challenges that people in this area face. First, the data is not free and open. The providers, such as Twitter, Facebook, etc., dictate who can do what kind of science by giving differential access to data to different groups. Um, the data that you get is often only a sample of the data, and we don't really understand the biases um, that are being that are in that data because of the way it was collected or the way that the data platforms chose to give it out. And these biases, therefore, are rarely accounted for in doing the analysis. The data itself is not preserved, so you cannot take old studies and go back and replicate it because many of the platforms have policies that after an account has been suspended for so long or after data has been removed for so long, it's gone. It's literally wiped out. OK, they don't necessarily store things right. So replication is difficult. So proof by replication doesn't really work well in this field. The data itself is not fully shareable because you reuse is limited by the terms of service of the of the of the uh, data of the of the platforms and the data production itself is time variant. That is the if like Weibo, for example. We were trying to collect data from Weibo and every few days for a while they were changing their API. So what data you could get out changed dramatically from day to day. Twitter just made a major change in its API, right? And it has, and they've given the new one out to academics, but they want to switch the other one. Major change in what kind of data is available. So data production itself changes a lot. And finally, the policies in this area are out of sync with the technology and science. And as our lawmakers and as the uh, people who run the IT shops and in, in organizations try to erect new policies, they're often doing so in the blind because they don't under themselves understand how social media works. If you have any doubt of that, go back and watch um, any of the videos where they captured Congress uh, questioning uh, people like Zuckerberg. What are some of the social cyber abilities that are currently? 
Well, currently we're very able to identify topic groups or an echo chambers to identify influential users, influential key actors, core topics, trending topics, bots, th thread jacking, things like that. That's kind of easy, okay? Or at least it's easy now. It wasn't when people first started, but people have been working on this, right? Since 2004. What are things under development? Things like back checking, uh, doing, I, doing auto identification of gender or personality or age, Sentiment mining, although there's a lot of work on sentiment mining, it's still absolutely horrid. Um, nudging technology to get people to kind of think before they act. Uh, troll detection, which is identifying these humans uh, acting in disruptive ways. Polarization metrics, hate speech detection, video modification detection. A lot of these are things that people are currently working on. And you can see that a lot of these are really focusing on different ways of affecting uh, whether or not the information is that that you see is what the source originally sent or seeing if what the information you see can be recognized as having the same intent as what the source originally intent was. Now let's think about this inter historically for a bit. As I said, disinformation has always been with us. Social influence campaigns have always been with us. One of the areas where this has played out, where there's been a lot of historical work, is in the area of information warfare. Now, in the area of information warfare, people talk about something called the Russian playback or the Chinese playback. And during the Cold War and so on, people were very good at analyzing you know, what were the ways, standard ways, in which Russia was trying to influence people? And during, you know, World War II, it was what were the standard ways that Germany or Japan were trying to influence people? Okay, and that led to this idea of the four Ds, dismiss, distort, dismay, and distract, which are tactics that one can take and that have been seen over and over again in social media. When, and even as late as 2018, this was the way in which groups like NATO and others were understanding the intent of, very, of actors in social media, okay? And, but, but this means what they're doing is they're focusing just on what is being said, and they're focusing on very negative things. But let's think about what's really going on in social media. As people in social cybersecurity have discovered, a lot of what's really going on is this focus uh, on is this ability to exploit the technology by all getting your stuff prioritized, but by repurposing abandoned accounts. There's this ability to exploit uh, your mind, right? A lot of the way in which influence campaigns are conducted are actually done to take advantage of the fact that you as an individual have all these cognitive biases, like confirmation bias, the fact that you believe something is more true or you interpret new information to confirm what you think you already know. They also are designed to exploit your worldview. That is, they will make you think there's the appearance of consensus, make you think that everybody agrees, and then you will automatically, in your mind, create a generalized other and act as though that a group who agrees really exists and you will respond to the world accordingly. So they will exploit these three things. Now that's far different than saying, oh, I'm building an AI bot, right? And in fact, we know that there's a lot of heuristics that people talk about and use for determining whether it's not something is credible online, right? So there's this tendency of people to believe that things are true. That's you know kind of it's a, it's a it's a you know it's kind of a truth bias, and you can take into account these various heuristics out there and combine them and recombine them in different ways to actually exploit some of these cognitive biases that people have. For example, reputation. Well, how do you judge reputation? Well, you usually rely on name recognition. Oh, that's from IBM. I must believe it. Oh, that's from you know Google. I must believe it. But people are very bad at reading carefully. So all you do is you make a typo in the name. People still think it's from the same source, but in reality, 
you've ruined that company's credibility because you're actually putting out fake news under a slightly different name. Endorsement. If you see a lot of people liking something, you like it too. You can buy likes. You can you can put bots on something to make it look like something is good. You can have a thousand a set of trolls go out there and just say, yes, this is good. Yes, this is good. Endorsement doesn't really mean much in social media. And in fact, it's, it's almost impossible to tell fake endorsements from real endorsements in some cases, and in most cases. Uh, consistency, yeah. Did you validate your information by checking different websites, by checking different sources? In social media, that doesn't work because all those different sources could be owned by the same mega source. Okay, Do you, does, it, does the information itself not conform to your expectations? So if I want you to believe myself, I just have to do it, say it in such a way that it matches what you already think, right? Uh, but yet it's, you know, slightly twisted. And again, is it persuasive, right? Um, does, does it, do you suspect that this appears to be advertising? If not, then it pro it's probably not. Okay, although that's not true in social media which is one of the ways in which QAnon actually promoted uh, indirect sales of tons of goods and goods like um, health food things and uh, various things to help you um, meditate and so on as actually a way of recruiting people. Now, I told you about the Black Panther. Let me tell you about Captain Marvel. So if you thought the Black Panther was going to cause disinformation, Captain Marvel was going to too. Because, you know, here we have a female superhero. I will tell you, in my group, some, some of the gentlemen in my group did not believe this would be true because why would anyone do that? In point of fact, there was a ton of disinformation about this movie, most of it based off of Brie Larson, arguing that she had said that she did not want men to come to her movie. That's actually not what she said. And there was a huge online discussion around this. And... Two of the different and two different lines of disinformation were arguing that Brie Larson had, you know, said this when they had it. They differed in that one of them just simply said to boycott the movie. The other one said, no, don't boycott. Take the Alita challenge. Watch the Alita movie instead. So what I want to show you is that there were these were two very different strategies. And the Alita challenge was meant to excite people by getting them to watch the Alita movie. The boycott one was one to create dismay. Both of them are tied off of false information. Both of them are spreading disinformation about Brie Larson. But the Alita challenge one, the exciting one, the happy one, had a much longer shelf life, right? It lasted much, much longer in social media and got much more attention than did the other one. Partly it was because it was happy, not sad. The four Ds are all sad, okay? which is why we often want to look for things that are exciting or enhancing or engaging. The other thing that let the disinformation on the Alita Challenge go further is that you also had celebrities retweeting it, and you even had more news agencies retweeting it. And the fact that it's coming more from celebrities and more from news agencies makes it last longer. So if you can get your disinformation to be also spread by an apparent news agency or by a celebrity, it's going to last longer in the, in, the, in the social media world. One of the ways in which you can get uh, your information also to last longer is to make it come from a media that is owned by a state. So if we look at state-sponsored news sources and state-sponsored accounts like those out of China, Russia, Canada, et cetera. Now, most countries have some kind of state-sponsored account. They vary dramatically on whether they contain accurate or inaccurate information. Um, they vary dramatically, you know, in terms of how actively they're used and so on. The point I want to make here is that in state-sponsored accounts, particularly China and Russia, the actors that surround those are, and that retweet their information are not necessarily people. And in the case of China and Russia, they're overwhelmingly bots all the ones that were on the right are are the are actually accounts that, that are red or bots that are surrounding China or Russia. And the, whereas the white ones are ones that are actually uh, people. 
and they are busy out there retweeting it. So they've got these armies of bots around them retweeting all their messages and trying to get their attention. Why might you care? Well, here's an example of why you would care. Um, there's this guy, C.T. Lau. C.T. Lau is a critic of China. He's a critic of the Chinese Communist Party. C.T. Lau has a lot of expats from China who pay attention to him and so on. Now, the real C.T. Lau here is on the left. On the right is C.T. Lau, who started tweeting, who spent a lot of time tweeting during the pandemic, who is sitting there surrounding, is sitting there outside of the Chinese state-sponsored media and retweets a lot of things they say, in particular retweets things that had to do with how the U.S. created the pandemic because we created it in a bioweapons lab in Fort Detrick. We sent it over there. Uh, with the soldiers for, for this uh, military exercise, and we infected Wuhan and then brought it back. CT Lao, now notice, it's C, their real Twitter name is CT Lao 3, the real Twitter name here is CT Lao 2. Most people don't read that carefully, right? Most people would see, oh, CT Lao, I guess they just got a new number at the end, they didn't pay attention to it, okay? And so what you have here, is a lot of people who are following this CT Lao started following this CT Lao. They're following the, the bot, that this is a bot that's actually trying to mimic the real CT Lao. And now what they're doing is they're getting all this disinformation, thereby ruining the real CT Lao's reputation and so on. Now, this is a very cheap way to do it. This is a very simple bot, but today we can also do it with deep fakes. Deep fakes, of course, are a much more expensive way of doing this, but they are becoming increasingly realistic. They are also decreasing in cost. And they are being weaponized against women. There was a study that was done by Deep Trace in September of 2019 that at that point in time found over 15,000 uh, deep fakes online with their, with their tool. Of those 15,000 uh, deep fakes, 96% of them were pornographic. And of the pornographic ones, 99% of them were mapping faces of female celebrities onto the bodies of porn stars. The point about the deep fake, and, to, and the number since then, of course, has escalated. Non-consensual pornography, which is what this is, is, has finally been recognized by California and has been written into law as being illegal in California. It is not throughout the rest of the United States, but this is one case where laws worked closely with uh, and lawyers work closely with uh, scientists in the social cybersecurity area to actually put in place a new law. Deep fakes today, uh, a growing number of them, but like I said, they are very weaponized against certain groups. What you saw happening as you got closer to the election, they were also weaponized against the LGBTQ community and against um, minority, other minority, other minority groups. In general, disinformation has targets, and it typically targets women. It typically targets the LGBTQ community, and it typically targets minority groups. What is happening there besides, you know, affecting their reputations and so on? It actually serves to drive them out of the conversation so that they don't engage in as much dialogue back and forth about the sh what they want to be happening in their country or their community. This is an example. This is one example. Let's look at another type of use of, of just uh, cheap fakes, which is the Russian bots. This is an example of the Russians sending out campaigns uh, during the pandemic. This is one that actually uh, backfired and didn't work, but what they did was they sent out uh, tweets that basically um, had these images, images that were faked that simply showed that people doing things like replacing um, an EU flag with a Russian flag and arguing that the uh, Italian citizens want to express their gratitude to Russia for helping them fight the pandemic. OK, totally backfired. This did not hear. People looked at this and laughed and said, yeah, yeah, yeah. What was Russia's response? It was a joke. It was just that. It was just a joke. This wasn't real. You should know better. People hide. 
behind saying something is a joke when they send disinformation, if they get caught. This has very deleterious aspects, and but it makes it hard to prosecute. A deeper version of this, which is the conspiracy theories stories. Conspiracy stories are increasingly occurring in social media. Uh, they are disseminated from one media platform to the next. They often begin um, on blogs or on these so-called fake news or uh, news sites, but they are critical because conspiracy stories has been shown historically to play a key role in actually uh, radicalizing people, getting them to get engaged in violent acts, getting them to be engaged in terrorism, getting them to be engaged in hate acts. And, and, in, and if you look at a lot of the mass shootings that have occurred, many of the individuals there were motivated by the things they read, by the conspiracy stories that they read and that they were and part of the conspiracy groups they were part of online. The various social media platforms, the algorithms that they use that help you build communities, that help you preserve your privacy, that help you like things, that help you get groups together who don't know each other. Many of those things simply nurture and protect conspiracy actors and beliefs. And if they start trying to move them off, as they did in the case of ISIS, as they did in the case of QAnon, all they do is they pop up on a different social media platform and they pop re back up on whichever platform just banned them, like Twitter or Facebook, with signals and messaging to people about where to go to find them. But conspiracy stories have gotten more elaborate. For example, this is the New World Order one that has occurred and it has spread along with the pandemic throughout the world. It basically goes like this. Uh, Bill Gates is a smart guy. You know, he uh, he created the virus uh, and he made sure that it got spread uh, to China and throughout the world because he knew that this kind of virus would cause the world to go on lockdown, I meaning people would be staying in their homes. Uh, they wouldn't be able to go out and so on, which meant they would have to order in more food. They would have to order in whatever they want. They couldn't pay cash for things as much. And so they would have to go cashless and use their credit cards more. He also decided to invest in 5G. Why? Because 5G would be what would all the information back and forth these credit card companies would flow through the airwaves and, and you would need 5G to help carry all, all of that information as well as all the information back to these people. But in addition, 5G can be used to control RFID tags. RFID tags can be micro miniaturized and they can even be put under your skin. And in fact, in countries like, um, I believe it's Sweden, there are people with RFID chips in their fingertips that they use to unlock their doors so they don't have to carry keys. So here we're gonna use micro miniaturized RFID chips. We're gonna have 5G towers and we can use those 5G towers to communicate with our RFID tags. Then we will inject these RFID tags along with the vaccination. And if you went and got your vaccine shot, you may notice many of the bottles had RFID tags on the outside, not in the needle, and so on. But when we do this, we will inject the RFID tag into the people, allowing them to be controlled by the 5G towers, which now they're all going through anyway because they went cashless. And now we can control everyone. Yay. That's basically the conspiracy theory. Not true. Okay. But it's based off things that in some sense are true. There are more 5G towers now. There are RFID tags that are miniaturized. More people went cashless, you know, et cetera. Okay, but this is an example of the kind of story that is very elaborate and that gets spread and it spreads throughout the world very rapidly without the use of deep fakes or anything like that. It's just, and it's just simply disseminated through social media. Deep fakes help and embed it nowadays by actually acting as talking heads for some of the people in the scenario, such as Bill Gates. A lot of disinformation and a lot of attacks on, on individual groups and social media are spread using memes. Memes are just used as a tool for influence, and there's more memes being spread every day. Importantly, memes exist where people simply go and change the 
the wording on them, okay? And as they change the wor wording on it, they are creating a real nuanced debate. And what we're seeing increasingly is that during political events, people use memes and change the words as a way of engaging in discussion and carrying out debate. But they're also because they have more traction, they fly through the airways more, and they're harder for programs to detect and, and stop the spread of this kind of information. Why do we find uh, social cybersecurity people have also found why disinformation is spread? It's spread for fun. It's spread to alleviate boredom. It's spread for, to, to get more money. Many people make money off spreading disinformation. They get paid to spread it. It's spread to disrupt civil society, to reduce the voice of minority groups. It's spread to foster political agendas. And it's also false. It's also spread to build communities and to build new groups. OK, you may be wondering about some of these images. Some of them you may recognize. I want to point to this one here, which is the little boy. This was actually sent out by some teenagers uh, after um, a Manchester United game, basically saying that they, they uh, went to this concert and their little brother was lost. And please help us find him. This led to a police hunt. OK. Tons of resources are utilized to find this kid. This kid was the poster child for autism. This kid was an adult at the time this message was sent out. Okay, this was just my, my teenagers because they thought it would be funny. Okay. So there's lots of initiatives in this area. I want to mention three that are going on in our group. One is Project OMEN, which is producing a scalable training environment for helping people understand how they can be influenced and are influencing others in social media. Another one, a big project that a bunch of people are working on is identifying and minimizing bias to promote discussion and depolarization. A third one is on media manipulation, looking at how to identify and counter media manipulation to increase individual safety and resilience. Approaching these kind of problems is non-trivial and requires utilizing lots and lots of tools. For example, uh, we uh, to do data collection, we use the Twitter APIs, Python scripts, collect, duplicate, clean, and the same would be true for, for Reddit and, so, and Facebook, et cetera. Then we'll run a technology called NetMapper, which is a computational linguistic thing that extracts sentiment and those emotional cues I mentioned. We run a bunch of machine learning tools that identify bots, detect hate speech, identify what city, state, country this, is, this stuff is coming from, classifies actors as to whether they're news agencies, government actors, et cetera. And for English speaking stuff, classifies it according to whether it's conservative or liberal. liberal then we put it through network analytics and visualization. Social cybersecurity research requires many, many tools. And it's good to get used to a lot of them. Social cybersecurity issues, according uh, to the National uh, National Academy, the areas that they identified for research are social cyber forensics, identifying who is conducting, identification of maneuvers, and the strategies used to conduct those attacks, intent identification, that is identifying motives, information diffusion, tracing attacks through time, measure new measures of effectiveness of attacks new ways of identifying who is susceptible to attacks and then identifying how to mitigate these attacks i'm pointing this out because these are areas that because they were recognized by the national academy and others are now being the kinds of things where grant proposals are being looked for from the national science foundation and others um, because these are considered important key areas. Social cybersecurity has been written in as a key component of the national plan and is a key need for this for the country. Social cyber forensics, again, its idea is to identify perpetrators. It is made difficult by the fact that you often try to have to go back and forth between the real web and the dark web, and you basically need more work to identify better, better theories and methods in this area. For information maneuvers, the idea, again, is that we need better interdisciplinary research to develop computer models and theories about information maneuvers in cyberspace, how people are doing things, when they're doing them, which and how they're coordinating. So theories of uh, online coordination would fall into this area. Uh, 
information diffusion. The idea is that we need more research to, to looking at multimedia diffusion, how stuff goes from platform from from say Facebook to Twitter to blogs back and forth, and what the relative affordances of those are. They always the same actors on all of them. Are they different actors? Um, you know, and how can you and what set of things it works best to escalate a message or to de-escalate it? Uh, from effectiveness of attacks, the idea is to develop new measures to measure the impact of information campaigns. Let me explain what the issue here is. The issue here is if you go to any of these tools that are out there that help you uh, surf through social media, they'll usually measure what is going on in terms of what are called vanity metrics. How many people like this post? How many times was it retweeted? How many um, followers does someone have? In point of fact, those are cute, but they can be manipulated. You could just replace things with bots. You get the same effect. What we really want to know are not those. What we really want to know is the impact on society. Is this causing polarization? Is this causing mass hysteria? Is this causing people to purchase more goods and services? You know, what is the real world offline consequences of this uh, of these uh, online attacks? And that's really what the focus and what the issue is here. But understanding the relationship between the offline to online is very, very difficult. Uh, understanding who is most susceptible to attacks. We need to be better able to characterize the groups at risks and to identify ways to increase their awareness and of malicious information. So it's not just, it's not as easy as just simply saying, gee, in Western cultures, women, LGBTQ, and minority groups are at risk. Well, more precisely within them, are their subgroups more at risk? And why are they at risk? And what's needed to stop it? And what are the exact laws we could put in place to, to protect them? And how is that different in South America? And how is that different you know, in the Asia Pacific area? That's really the issue. In terms of response to attacks, the idea is to support the design of better counter messaging strategies. Recently, we have looked at all the different counter messaging out of the, all the counter strategies that have been proposed uh, in the past 15 years. And when you look at all the different ways people think they can stop bad stuff from happening online, the vast majority of it has been someone scratching their head and said, I think this will work. Let's try it. The vast majority of them have never been tried. If they have been tried, they've only been tried in a lab, not in the real world. And a lot of the things and the few things that have been tried in the real world, many of them have backfired or had severe unintended consequences. So understanding counter messaging is a huge issue. For example, suspending a tagging account is this contains disinformation often causes more people to read it than would have read it initially. So these are some of the research directions that people suggest people to work in, such as better characterizing groups at risk, supporting design of counter messaging, et cetera. For science, this means, again, social cyber forensics, information maneuvers, governance, mitigation, diffusion, et cetera. So how do we combat disinformation today? Today, uh, what's being suggested to citizens is to call out disinformation if you see it. The sooner you call it out, the more likely you are to stop it. Don't spread disinformation even if you think it's funny. For example, things about Hillary Clinton involved and her involvement with um, with child pornography and, and child abuse, etc., cetera, uh, was one of the things that underlay, underlay Pizzagate. People were retweeting messages about Hillary being involved in this, not because they believed it, but because they hated Hillary Clinton. So they wanted other people to know they hated her. So they just spread it. But by spreading it, they gave more credence to it. Count, you can also counter disinformation with sarcasm and humor. You can, should check to see if sources are credible. Do all those things we talked about, like check, et cetera. Fact check as much as possible and so on. But those ideas alone are nowhere near enough, but they're part of it. Corporations, state and local uh, state, officials, et cetera, 
need to think about developing social cybersecurity teams, just like they have cybersecurity teams that help preserve their group. A social cybersecurity in a company would help make sure that its brand remains secure, that it built up a trusted network of allies to spread its messaging, and so on. Having neutral and authoritative voices are critical for spreading true information repeatedly. If Indonesia did not do this, then when a tsunami came, it would not be able to spread out information through social media that a tsunami is coming go to a shelter. That's an important thing that local and state officials need to do. And once Indonesia, in this case, did maintain a trusted voice around that, they were actually able to get people to go to shelters faster because they were because of the uptick and spread of information from um, that was coming through social media. And of course, you want to maintain and publish lists of low reputable or disinformation websites. Make them clear which ones there are. Um, oops, sorry. Okay. okay, the new information environment, I want to point out, it, it has an unprecedented speed and it requires us to respond quickly in adapting how we do science in translating our theories that we come out to operation. We can't just live in ivory towers and we need to transition to tools to those that need them right away. If you wait for them to go through the normal transition path of seven years, we're on to the next social media crisis, right? Because there's new things occurring every, it has like a two year life cycle here. So it's basically we have to rethink the scientific ecosystem in order to do social cybersecurity. So um, I want to open it up for additional questions at this point, and that's where you can get more. And you can also email them to me as well. Robbie, you can unmute. Hi, Dr. Carly, I have a question for you. Uh, with regards, it seems that um, much of the things that you talked about were really on the negative side with misinformation and also uh, quite reactionary with combating disinformation. I'm wondering if similar techniques and tools could be used for more positive means to promote democracy, diversity, climate change, uh, recognition and respect for human rights. Um, as well as looking at the positive qu consequences that occur. Um, absolutely. Um, and in fact, some of these exact same strategies that are used to promote bad stuff are actually used for marketing and marketing good stuff. Um, uh, some of the strategies of using the botnets and so on have been used in Indonesia to actually spread information about the tsunamis coming and to, and to activate groups there as well. So the exact same strategies can be used and counter it. The other thing is that you can also um, fight fire with fire and that a lot of the techniques that are used to um, attack groups, you can use those to attack the attackers. And so that is very possible as well. Um, Although doing so within the U.S. is sort of against our nor our norms of practice, and so we typically don't engage in those kinds of things. Um, does that begin to answer your question? It does. What about for uh, more lasting impacts in uh, like respect for human rights and democratic norms? Uh, so, yes, they could be used in that way. The trouble right now with respect to um, uh, democratic norms with lasting impact, like in terms of like helping give voice to minorities or helping people believe in climate change, is that what's going on right now it is a little more complex and that the way those groups are being attacked um, and those things are being attacked is with this very coordinated uh, approach. And, uh, and at the same time, sowing confusion on the other side. So in order to promote the democratic norms, to promote climate change, etc., what you need is to be able to actually counter the confusion voices that are coming in as, as well as doing the pro things. That makes a lot of sense. Thank you. It's almost like we need bots to be promoting democracy. Yes, you do. Okay, 
Okay, uh, sorry, Ravi, was your question answered? I see your hand still up. Yeah, um, I think I can lower my hand if. Oh, okay. Thanks. Uh, looks like uh, Golfo can go next, or is that Alex? Yes, yes, thank you. I have a question about the uh, understanding the real. Uh, consequences, the impact on society, and the relationship between online and offline. What are the tools that you use for that? Do you do interviews? Do you get into the community and uh, conduct surveys? How do you measure that impact? So I'm going to speak broadly, not just from what my group does, but from what is being done across the field, OK? Um, there are a large number of people who are going into the field and interviewing people uh, and talking to them to find out how they're being impacted. Um, there's and many of those people are utilizing, uh, you know, good journalistic practices and so on to do that's so that is being done. The second way that's being done is running these big, massive surveys um, and then getting people when they agree to take the survey to agree to also give them their social media account accounts. So you follow them online and you ask them a series of panel questions. That's been another approach that's been used. Um, third approach that's been used is to do what's called um, kind of general comparison, which is, you know, I've got all the social media data about what people are saying about wearing face masks. And I, although I don't know the exact age, gender, et cetera, to the extent I can put it into categories saying this is coming out of rural Colorado and it's predominantly you know, white males, I can then use other survey data that was collect or other data that was collected, such as vaccination data, and say, oh, this is the vaccination data at a gross gross level for white males in rural Colorado, and I can then match them. I don't know that I have a one-to-one -one match, but I have a group-to-group -group match. That's also another way that's done. Um, so those those are three different ways in which people are doing it. There's new studies that people are talking about doing, which are utilizing um, MRI, MRI scans and showing people social media images and then study which part of their brains activate. Uh, is another way that some people are trying to make the connection and still others are doing it by doing it kind of from a time lag, from a time perspective. That is, they know when particular events occur and they know what the chatter on social media looked like around those events and looking at the relationship. So, for example, we know that when um, like during the pandemic, Whenever a governor made an announcement about a new lockdown procedure or, you know, a new mask mandate, the discussion in Twitter in that state went way up. And if Trump said something, it really went way up across the entire U.S. So, so we know that a lot of it is event dictated. Does that answer your question? Yes. Thank you, Kathleen. Mm -hmm. I'm sure some of the rest of you have comments or questions. Brian, were you trying to ask something? I saw a check by your name, so. Great, guess not. 
Okay, I do want to encourage you to feel free to reach out to me. Uh, if you'd like to be on our distribution list for further events or to just get, you know, and further information, please let myself or Jennifer know and we can add you to the distribution list. I also want to encourage all of you who are interested in this space um, to look at the Social Cybersecurity Working Group page. This is a group that is that uh, that is trying to put together knowledge commons with information about things in the space, like you know, descriptions of courses, where you can go find data set, where you can go find tools, etc. And many of you may have things you would like to see listed there, or you may find things there that are of use to you. And we recommend both. Um, please suggest things to add, or please you know use whatever is there. We also will be linking all of the, um, you know, we will link talks and papers to our ideas website for the information that is coming out in this group uh, coming out as well. You can go there, for example, for new information about the Project Omen, as well as for um, new information on both the polarization work and on the work on um, media literacy and and uh, and counter and countering uh, bad things happening. So I thank you all for joining us today and I will stay on uh, for, for any questions we have for another 10 minutes. You're getting lots of applause feedback, which is nice. Good. Again, if you have questions, you can drop them in the chat or you can just unmute and ask. Hey, Dr. Carly, you mentioned that one of the biggest challenges in the field is data access and, and data restrictions, and you also mentioned um how important it is to look at information diffusion and how that same challenge shows up like when you're trying to find the spread of information across platforms do you have any advice there or is it kind of just a sticking point that's in the hands of the platforms at this point so one is that i think that the more people who you know um, send out messages that data is a challenge on social media, the more the platforms will pay attention. Uh, I would say that the platforms are trying to do things to make some data available. The trouble is a lot of the times the data that they make available um, doesn't always meet the kind of things we as scientists need. So the more we can make them aware of those needs, the better. So for example, um, Every now and then, very different platforms will hold conferences and you know solicit input. Going and attending those and giving input is a good thing. Uh, the other thing, so that's one thing. The other thing is that um, you can do a lot uh, with some of the social media platforms with what is publicly available through their terms of service. So, for example, if you're using Twitter, uh, what you want is a research group that is reasonably large so that you can um, legitimately collect from multiple media or from multiple, you can generally collect multiple feeds of data at once and cross compare them uh, and link them together. The second thing that you can do is you can be very careful about uh, and very narrow in your search terms or in the bounding boxes you use or the way you search. And I will, to give Twitter credit, its new API makes it possible to get more data for academics than ever before. Um, so, and it makes it possible to get different kinds of data. With CrowdTangle, the main thing is to keep letting CrowdTangle and therefore Facebook know that um, <clears throat> 
They're not giving you access to network information. And the more you keep saying, I can't do this kind of study, I need this. Um, they, they just need to hear that frequent a lot because they are listening to people, what kind of data, and they kind of triangulate and say, well, what do the most people complain about? Is there a way we can make that visible? And then they have to go to their lawyers and so on about it. The other one is to try to get your IRBs educated on what social media data is like so they can educate the government IRBs uh, and the corporate IRBs so that they are no longer, so they understand that it's okay to give certain types, a certain type of data. Those are a bunch of things you can do. Uh, the other thing, the other thing is to start looking at the bio, is use the fact that you're not getting all the data to your advantage and look and focus on the biases that are in it <clears throat> and so on. You can also um, do kind of intermittent diffusion and say, I don't know the exact diffusion path, but I can know the kinds of diffusion paths that are consistent with this. And that may be just a whole new science of diffusion we have to invent. All right, um, we're seeing a question, sorry, uh, in the chat that uh, the hard problems in uh, social cyber security, um, are they due to a lack of interdiscipline knowledge or computational limitations or both? Um, definitely both. Uh, you're not going to solve this with just computer science. Um, you really need, we really need to bring more different disciplines together and build new theories around this, right? And we need to build um, more intelligent algorithms that take into account emotional intelligence and that take into account the way humans think. We want to, some of the best successes people have had recently are with people in the loop uh, computation so that you're allowing people to do part of the intelligence because people do it so differently than do computers. So it's, a, it's, really, it's really both. Got it. Um, so we have another question from Samantha Phillips saying, uh, what does accountability look like for those who are deliberately spreading disinformation? And could you speak uh, more about what research identifying those most susceptible to social cyber attacks involves? Okay, so for people spreading disinformation, um, they're pretty much protected right now. Uh, they're pretty much protected uh, because under various kinds of freedom of information or privacy regulations, etc. <clears throat> And they can also just claim that the disinformation, they just meant it as a joke. So it's very hard to uh, prosecute anyone for spreading disinformation, per se. There are some limiting cases, such as um, disinformation that leads to physical harm or death such as people who spread stories that drink methane, drink bleach, and it, it will cure you of COVID, uh, which actually led to the death of many people in the Middle East who actually drank methane. Um, that that, is, that is, now, is now in some cases being viewed as outright criminal activity and as intent to kill. So that, that, one's, that one's prosecuted. Um, the uh, any kind of non-consensual uh, pornography um, that is like including the deep fake porn uh, that I was talking about, those can be prosecuted in California, and so there's something against those individuals. But what well, the idea here is to try to get more of the legal uh, legal people across the U.S. and throughout the world is to get them to think more about 
disinformation as being like pornography and that the extreme forms of it can be prosecuted. There are some, there also are, I should also add that there are prosecutions against disinformation in Europe and certain countries are passing, uh, Eastern and Western Europe are passing new laws about disinformation there. Um, the US is kind of behind in that respect. Uh, that was the first half of the question. The second half of the question, could you repeat it? Yes, so the second question is, could you speak more about research identifying those most susceptible to social cyber attacks and what that involves? Uh, okay, so <clears throat> there's two parts to the susceptibility part. One is identifying who is mostly getting attacked and then identifying whether or not they are truly susceptible. And the research on identifying who is truly susceptible has largely been done with questionnaire data or in the or in laboratories where they've um, given them different kinds of disinformation or different kinds of attacks and seen whether or not they um, believed it or whether or not they were said that they would change their behavior because of it. Of course, you don't know whether or not they really will change their behavior until it actually occurs to them, but that's a different issue. That's a lot of the to identify who was being attacked the most. A lot of that has been done by simply looking, looking, collecting data on a particular area and then identifying the different lines of disinformation, the different influence campaigns and seeing what are they focusing on and and moreover, who are they mentioning? What communities are those individuals in? And so on. And what you see happening across like all the elections in Western Europe and the US is that uh, there's always a huge line of disinformation that is aimed at women and that you will see the same people who are doing that. It's on it's on women's related issues. It's mentioning women. It's mentioning specific, it's getting uh, into the feeds of disproportionately into the feeds of women. Uh, same thing with LGBTQ and the same thing with uh, minority groups. And in and in the US, that means principally um, Hispanic and um, African-Americans, although increasingly now Chinese. Uh, and for different countries, it will be different. It will be different groups. How susceptible they are to that disinformation has then um, been studied in a variety of ways, or has then looked at in different ways. So, for example, with African Americans, uh, we know that there's a huge number of these stories gone to African Americans. We knew a certain number of individuals were African Americans online that uh, because they had either self-identified, which you can find in their things or because a survey afterwards found out. Uh, and those people just stopped. They suspended, they stopped their account. They, they went away, they moved to another platform. Follow-up surveys and one-on-one -on -one discussions with many members of the African-American community by other members of the African-American community say, hey, that, you know, we're being targeted. What are you doing about this? They say, I don't even want to engage. I'm not even going to go near that social media stuff from now on. So that's, that's an example. It's it's um, it takes a lot. It takes a combination of empirical analysis of the lines of attack and of who's being attacked. And it takes uh, a lot of in-depth uh, discussions, uh, surveys, et cetera, with the individuals to find out how susceptible we are. And it also takes inferring susceptibility from the response. Thank you, Dr. Carly. We're going to take a break now. Um, this meeting is going to be ended and a new meeting will start in the channel in a few minutes. Um, in the meantime, if you want to peruse the reading list channel or the Knight Fellows poster session channels in, in this team, and we'll see you back here at 445 with Dr. Carly again, who will go more in depth into influence and social media campaigns. Thank you, Jennifer.